I'll kick off the Civicerium hosting and performance optimizations uh, for Civicon 2015. My name is Peter Petrick, I'm with Square, and uh, we'll be talking hopefully in, a, in an interactive discussion here about what you're looking for, what you're needing, what you want to find out, and uh, us sharing some experiences. And if other people have their own stories and want to chime in, uh, again, this is not necessarily me standing here and you guys listening and, and or taking notes. It's more about an interactive discussion. And then we can kind of go down certain paths that you're more interested in and less in others. Um, to give you an idea who I am, if you haven't met me around, uh, we've been involved with CVCRM for a number of years. And uh, about five years ago at Square, uh, we were kind of consistently running. We're a development shop that does Drupal, CVCRM, integrations, etc. And uh, we continued to run into issues with uh, delivering an excellent product to a client. It performed well. Everything was going fine. And uh, then they would put it on a host that shall not be named or five of them, and five different ones, and uh, their website would take five, ten seconds to load, or that'd be PHP errors, or they would get, you know, MySQL timeouts, et cetera, et cetera. So really out of necessity, we decided internally to start as a pilot to, to host a couple of the clients. And it turned out that now five years later, people are coming to us and saying, uh, you're the performance experts, you're the hosting experts, what should we be doing, how should we be setting it up. Um, we've actually had some other development shops come to us and say, even our internal environment between dev, test, production, you know, and code control, version control, etc., can you just help us out here? So we've gotten inquiries from all over the place. And uh, we still support a lot of clients on their own infrastructure, but it's a, it's a very, very small minority. So most people that uh, we serve in some, uh, some matter, we host, we help to maintain it, we help to back it up, set up the redundancies, et cetera. Um, what kind of situations are you guys in? Let me help, help me understand who's in my audience here. Are you self-hosting, are you, uh, let, me, let me rephrase. If, are you self-hosting in a sense that somebody's got actual server in an office sitting somewhere plugged into the network? Okay, nobody in that category, good. You hosting on like a shared hosting? You hosting on dedicated? What are you guys doing? VPS? So uh, some of my clients I set up with VPSs. I try not to remarket anymore because of uh, insurance concerns around okay. um, PCR compliance. I also have some boxes that I run VPSs on. Okay. Um, in data centers. Very cool. VPSs. <coughs> VPSs? Um, VPSs, clients leasing dedicated hardware, okay. um, which they are splitting into different machines. We've got one dedicated system, dedicated and we're system. exploring Pantheon managed hosting services as well. Okay. Uh, put an asterisk next to Pantheon, specifically as it relates to CVCRM, yep. but also other experiences. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll talk about some specifics. I have one client who uh, uh, hosts internally in their own. Uh, okay, so we got their own. Uh, I've, I've been successfully hosted on uh, a shared platform. Yeah. All right, so let's take a look at what the outline is going to be today. We're going to talk obviously about the hosting and the different options, um, what the options are, where you can go. Uh, my main objective here is not to sell you on what we do. That's, uh, you know, that's beside the point. I'm here speaking more so from experience. If you want to talk about some specifics, I want to take that outside of the presentation, okay? This is really more of a discussion of points for you to research and understand and know what questions to ask rather than uh, a sales pitch or, or anything like that because everybody's needs are different. Um, this is definitely not a recipe for success because everybody's need are, needs are different. And uh, again, it's not a sales pitch. It's not a go to a particular and stay away from, from this and go, away, go, go towards here, okay? So I will share some experiences, whether it's shared hosting or uh, some Pantheon stories or, or some of those other things. And again, I'll just put an asterisk and saying this is the experience that we know or our clients have had. Uh, so again, do your own research. Some people will swear by a particular web host and other people will absolutely never do business with them again. Okay, so 
Um, so first of all, before you delve into the topic of I need to host, you need to think about, okay, what do I need? And uh, a lot of people send us an inquiry over the web or call us up and say, can you host, can you host us? And how much is it? What's your price list? And the short answer is that there is, you know, a lot of times you don't know what you don't know and you don't know. You know, I was talking to somebody earlier today, I think it was, um, and they said, well, we host all of our audio files, so we've got about, you know, 120 gigabytes worth of data files, okay? That's obviously going to be a different need for uh, storage and space than somebody who's got a relatively basic front-end website and uh, maybe 10,000 records in the city CRM database, right? Very different. Uh, what's, your, what's your need for speed in terms of uploads, downloads, uh, what's your speed, processor speeds, etc. cetera. Um, what kind of uptime do you need? If you're down for an hour, are you okay with that? If you're down for five minutes, are you okay with that? If you're down for 48 hours, are you okay with that? That's gonna determine again, what kind of responsiveness do you need? What kind of redundancies you need to set up? And uh, if anybody here is from kind of an engineering, architecting, hardware standpoint, you know that 99.99% uptime um, is kind of an elusive thing anyways, but every time you go to the additional 0.9, your costs go up tenfold. That's just an industry standard. If you want to go from 99.99 to 99.999%, you have to account for about a tenfold increase in cost of that infrastructure to achieve that. Um, the other thing is when you're considering your needs, it's easy to say, well, we don't know. Well, try to estimate it. Try to see where you're growing. And also on the other side, as you're comparing and trying to understand where uh, your potential providers are, um, un please understand there is no such thing as unlimited. Okay, <laughs> it, it's a great marketing term, but in reality, there is no such thing as unlimited. And if you actually read the fine print, they will tell you that we're using unlimited as a marketing term subject to throttling, shorting you off, you name it. Okay. Fair use. Uh, yeah. So fair use, etc. So consider the uptime, the bandwidth, the redundancy needs, backups. Everybody know the difference between redundancy and backups? I got some, some kind of nods and some few couple of like, I want to shake my head, but not really. So we'll get to that too. Um, and then uh, consider whether you might need a CDN, right? So that, those are all the different options you might want to look at. And again, this is just a very broad, very initial list. Uh, then when you're looking at hosting, start looking at this as a checklist and say, okay, do I want to host on Windows or, or a LAMP stack or a LAMP stack? Anybody know the, what the E stands for in the LAMP stack? Nginx. Okay. So the first one is Windows, so you're, you're going down the route of IIS. Uh, short answer, don't do it. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it should, can, technically should be an N, but somehow industry has picked up on the uh, the pronunciation of Nginx rather than the N on it. But uh, yeah, LAMP stack is your regular, you know, some flavor of uh, Linux operating system, Apache, MySQL, PHP. Um, a lot of people are starting to replace MySQL with MongoDB, uh, with other options. Again, depending on what you're doing, what your CMS is, how you're doing it, you might want to test thoroughly before you go outside of the recommended yeah, setup. People in the city CRM community have replaced MySQL with Recona or drop in replacements from MySQL. Yeah. We can't go to a NoSQL. Okay. So there are definitely alternatives for the for the database. And again, if you've got a we were just talking about deduplication here during the break before the session started. Um, if you want uh, if you want to give your server a run for its money. Uh, try to deduplicate a database of uh, 30,000 contacts and select all to deduplicate. <laughs> and you will see the size of temp files and everything else that starts being generated and uh, the MySQL loads or other loads, whatever you're using for the database, uh, while that's trying to run. Okay? It, it'll definitely uh, trigger a few alerts, hopefully, that you have set up. So take a look at the baseline. Um, so that's why I said, you know, look at the operating system, look at the LAMP stack, LAMP stack, look at the, the question mark instead of the M. Um, do you want to use Percona? Do you want to use Post, uh, Postgre? Do you want to use MongoDB? MariaDB. MariaDB. You know, so there's a lot of alternatives there. I would say start with MySQL. That's 
you know, nobody ever got fired for doing MySQL, so start with that. And then if you have performance problems or you can pinpoint and specifically say, okay, this is my limiting factor, this is where my problem is, then start kind of poking around. Uh, same thing with the, with the Windows part, you know. Uh, we've uh, dealt with a couple of clients and trying to look around the room, there was, yeah. Um, there were a couple of clients that are like, oh, we've got, you know, Microsoft donation, server licenses and everything. We have to be on Windows. And um, this is kind of like, you know, it's, it's a free kitten and it's a nightmare kitten. So um, be careful. Um, you're going to get it working, then you're going to upgrade and you're going to be right back to square one and uh, you're gonna have a lot of uh, potential issues there, so uh, not recommended. I would say shared hosting. Uh, if you wanna test out something, if you're an organization with a few hundred contacts, et cetera, um, okay, you know, try to get out of the gate and try to set up the CVCRM, et cetera, but uh, in general, again, I would say don't do it. Uh, CVCRM is resource intensive. Uh, there are a lot of different things that you may wanna tweak, whether it's your uh, PHP, settings files or um, MySQL files, et cetera, on a shared hosting, your hands are completely tied. Um, and sometimes it is very difficult to explain if you're a provider like we are, or you're a developer, or you're a freelancer that's uh, trying to have a client and they're like, well, wait a minute, you know, GoDaddy, I can uh, go for, you know, $25 a year probably. Uh, why should I pay somebody $25 a month, right? So. That's, a, that's like a 12-fold increase. We can't afford that. Um, again, you get what you pay for, so be very careful. Um, we've had clients that were absolutely adamant on a small installation that it had to be on a shared hosting. And um, I can tell you we spent more hours trying to get that working than if they would have just paid for a VPS or something like that. The hours you will put into it will come back and bite you in the most inconvenient moment. So be careful with that. Uh, I would look at Drupal and or, well, if you're talking Drupal like we are, then I would look at Drupal specific provider and or CVCRM specific provider. There is a list of providers on cvcrm.org. Uh, call them up, get in touch with them. Everybody's got a different angle. We all know who we are, uh, who's listed there. We a lot of times get all the same inquiries and uh, there are just different, um, different benefits and different approaches of how people are doing it and one might be better for you than the other. So look at that. Um, consider your own VPS, your dedicated servers, um, at your own risk. Unless you're in the sysadmin DevOps game, um, running that is, can be pretty dangerous. You know, when um, Poodle came out, when uh, all these security vulnerabilities pop up, are you up? Are you monitoring this? Are you applying those patches when they need to be applied? And again, this is not even, you know, are you up, are you down, are you getting alerts at eight o'clock on a Friday night that the server is not accessible? That's, that's just, okay, that's an inconvenience. But when you've got a bunch of data on your server and there is an SSL vulnerability that needs to be patched, you've got an issue on your hands. Uh, Heartbleed, I mean, there were bots testing for Heartbleed vulnerabilities within hours of that particular vulnerability being made public. Are you in a position to respond? Do you know what you're doing? And uh, running, a, running a server, the operating system, the, the Nginx or Apache, the database configuration and everything else, it's a, it's a whole different story. Then running your CMS, whole different story. And running CVCRM and optimizing for that, whole different story. So unless you want to, for that one website you're trying to host, you want to develop some, some high-end skills, again, it may or may not be worth it to go with somebody who does this for a living. Same thing with dedicated servers. Um, I know of only a handful of instances where people truly needed dedicated server, uh, even when they thought they did. Um, a lot of times the reconfiguration of the underlying infrastructure uh, saved them going down that path. It's wonderful to work on a server with 32 or 64 gigs of RAM and I mean everything just screams. Um, but that's kind of like you know, driving a Ferrari on a dirt road. It's just you're never going to get out of first gear for most of what in our community people need. Like I said, I can probably count on one hand the number of use case scenarios that I've either heard or been involved in and been pulled in where people are like, okay, we truly should consider a dedicated server. 
The one thing I will say about dedicated servers, if you are in a position, and we have some clients, and somebody mentioned they have a client who's got their own like uh, rack in the data center or their own internal data center. Um, again, this is one of those things, and we've considered it for our infrastructure too, except uh, you know, who's gonna be responsible when that hard drive dr dies on a Saturday morning, who's gonna be making the run to the data center? Are you gonna have a stack of hard drives and CPUs and power supplies things like that ready to go and replace. So just consider all of that. Last piece I mentioned here, and that one should be considered very carefully, is running a mail server is just as complex, if probably not more complex, than running a web server. Okay? So if you just think, oh, we're just gonna shoot it out via, you know, PHP mail function and uh, configure some uh, MTA to send it all out from our server, uh, you're about, 24 to 48 hours from being blacklisted and shut down. So be very careful if, you, if you're planning to send out any kind of volume of email that's over a few hundred, um, be very careful of how you set up your servers. And if you think, you know, okay, well, we'll just set up DKIM or SPF record or something like that and we'll be all good. Once you get on the blacklist, again, the, the amount of time to get off of it is virtually impossible. It's, it's a lot of work. So, and again, there's providers that hook up directly into CVCRM. There are providers for mail that uh, offer an SMTP gateway. It's a paid service, but trust me, what you're gonna pay them is nothing compared to uh, getting blacklisted if, if you're trying to do it yourself and you don't know exactly what you're doing. And the volume also makes a difference. We've had clients come to us that were hosted with professional gateways that's, that are paid outgoing email this particular client was sending out million plus emails a month, so the volume was pretty substantial. And um, we've actually found a bug in the provider's uh, setup that was allowing uh, spammers to go in, <coughs> bypass the credentials, and then these guys were getting nagged by the provider going, hey, you're sending out spam, and they're like, no, we're not. <laughs> so, but then we took them over onto our servers, but again, sending out a you know, million emails plus from just one client will tax your servers. Which provider is that? I'm, I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> but um, they supposedly patched it and there was a whole, the reason why I'm not going to tell you about that because there was apparently a lawsuit on go, afterwards between the provider and our client. Right. So okay. I just don't want to get into that. Okay. But uh, again, this is like trust but verify, you know. Look at what you're dealing with, understand how things work behind the, 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 the scene. Uh, a lot of providers are, you know, go here, put in a credit card number, and, uh, you know, don't bother us kind of thing. And again, for something fairly small and simple and non-critical, that might be enough. If you don't have a place where you, can, where you know you can send an email, like some, some people don't, won't give you a phone number, but you can send an email, and you know you're going to get an answer. So, so currently on this, we've got in, uh, integrations with... Uh, Socket Lab, SendGrid, uh, Mailchimp, Constant Contact, yep. and Mandel available for CCRM. Yep. Uh, Mailchimp. Pardon? Uh, Mailchimp. Uh, uh, okay, I don't know that one. Um, uh, do you have any recommendations against any of those? No, or? not against any of those. Okay. So if, if I'll, I'll answer his question in the way of it wasn't any one of those. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the integrations are there, but again, you can use any SMTP server. Like we've, we've worked with educational institutions, we've worked other institutions that run their own service for other reasons, and they just give you the gateway to the SMTP, maybe they limit that particular connection to the IP address, et cetera, and it works just fine. So there is no problem there. But again, don't, don't, don't take it lightly. A lot of people think, oh, city mail, I don't have to pay MailChimp, I'll just send it out via my server. And especially if you're, even on a VPS, but especially if you're on a shared hosting, a lot will limit you to like 100 outgoing emails an hour for 200 emails a day maximum. Done. Shut down. No more. And they will not send you a message saying deliveries failed. Everything in CVCRM is going to look like it went out, and you're going to send out 1,000 emails, and you're going to wonder why you had 10 opens. And people are going to go, we never got the email. I've dealt with plenty of those. All right. So those are things to consider. Now I'm going to break it down kind of by the, by the individual things. Uh, and again, we've already talked about uh, some of this. Look at the virtualization, underlying virtualization that's being used. Um, some are better than others. Uh, look at the disk throughput and latency. 
If you've got a bunch of virtual machines, even if it's a beefed up server, um, and a lot of other people are doing a lot of reads and writes off the, off the disk, you will notice it. Uh, these days, a lot of uh, providers will give you an option for an SSD, or some, some will even offer it as a default. It makes a difference. Okay? That will actually kill you more than your RAM requirements or your CPU requirements. Because a lot of the, a lot of the ways these VPSs are constructed is, if you, if you will, I'm simplifying here, your CPU brain power is sitting over here and your data storage is sitting over here. And it's actually the, both the hard drive slowness and the connection to the, uh, to the SAN that's going to throttle you back. Okay? Um, look at the, the ports that you're allowed to access or whether you have full control over it or not. And if not, you know, if you do, then block them or limit them, both incoming and outgoing, so that if somebody does happen to find and poke a hole into your system one way or another, uh, at least they can't hopefully send stuff out. Um, if you're doing SSH, my personal recommendation, first thing you should do is change port 22. Um, that's going to kill about 99.5% of uh, script kiddies trying to get into your server and getting a bunch of stuff in your air logs. Um, configure a firewall, whether you're doing IP tables, fail to ban, whatever you're doing, uh, try to configure it. Um, don't ask me how I know this, but uh, my strong recommendation is if you're adjusting your firewall rules, always keep at least two SSH windows open. <laughs> and those of you that are chuckling, I'm sure you're just uh, entertained by my joke. You would not know from a personal experience, right? Um, but what can happen, to, to those of you that are looking at me kind of funny, what can happen is you change the rules and you actually lock yourself out. So when you try to log in again, now you can't get in. Okay. If you have the second window open, that particular connection will stay intact and you can reset the rules and continue messing with it. So, um, and then configure your logging. Too little logging, you don't know what's going on. Uh, too much logging or too many alerts, uh, you kind of become blind to it. Right? If you get a couple, three emails a day that says, here's the status of this, backups run, this has happened, etc. cool. If, you, if you're getting uh, 15 emails an hour, chances are you're just going delete, delete, delete and you're not actually looking at what's going on until it says uh, disk status critical. <laughs> <laughs> so take a look at that. Um, Apache versus Nginx. Um, a lot of people like to use Apache, then put varnish in front of it as a, as a reverse proxy cache. Um, you can do it that way. Apache still has a pretty large memory footprint, so especially, who was I talking to? I'm, I'm trying to remember, they were uh, running a Drupal CDCRM installation, sizable number of contacts, and uh, with Apache on a one gigabyte VPS. So I was like, wow, magicians. Um, not impossible. I've actually seen it run on a 512, um, but uh, certainly not recommended for a production environment. Okay? Um, Nginx generally will have a smaller footprint, and by this point, you know, five years ago, it was you were way out on the on the edge trying to run uh, on Nginx today. It's a very solid, accepted alternative to Apache, and I would uh, probably say in some ways even more suited um, towards, towards the task. Um, you can use it as a proxy cache. You can turn on the PHP microcaching. You can turn, on the, uh, turn it on as a content proxy. Um, you can do a lot of fun stuff with it. Uh, it's feature-wise, is Definitely on part, if not way beyond Apache. Um, definitely look at your memory and CPU allocation. Um, a lot of times people get a big server and then it's still, you know, Nginx is there basically choking because it doesn't have enough memory and or CPU to actually do its thing. Uh, the other thing I, I put down there is GZIP. Um, how many of you go in into your Drupal performance settings, and I'm talking about Drupal specifically here, and check off the aggregate and compress uh, CSS and JavaScript? You should be all doing that, all right? Uh, IE, what was it, IE6 that had the odd limitation of uh, how, how many CSS files it would load at certain? Was it six? Yeah. Okay, thank goodness it's dead. Um, but there is another box there that says compress pages. Do you know what I'm talking about? That little check box is on the same performance screen. On every site that we host, it's un unchecked. 
because we're doing the GZIP compression at the NGINX level, which is more native, more much closer to the RAM and CPU. And if you're GZIPing it at the NGINX level and at the Drupal level, which is via PHP, it's kind of like, have you ever tried to zip up a zip file? <laughs> right? You're just wasting resources because you're not compressing it any further. It's the same thing here. So I would say figure out how to set it up. Uh, there is 10 different levels of how, how much you can do compression. The higher the compression, the smaller the files, but the higher the compression, the more resources you need. So it's a balance. Test. I can't tell you what specifically is your particular use case scenario. Um, MySQL. Many different ways, or database, let's just put it that way, but MySQL and specifically, use Memcache. It's there, use it, it works with uh, Drupal, it works with all the CMSs, it works with Civi CRM. Um, more so on the next slide, I've got PHP. Uh, if you're using the older versions, like 5.3 still, uh, anybody still running Drupal 6 sites? Okay, a few of you, so you're, you're probably on 5.2, 5.3 PHP. I'm actually running it on 5.4 and silencing the errors. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's fine. <laughs> so they're small, they're small sites. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong. There, there is enough already in PHP 5.3 where Drupal 6 already is kind of on a shaky ground there. Uh, going to 5.4 or certainly 5.5, you're in... Yeah, you turn off the notice or the error logs. And it's just notices. There's no. <laughs> yeah. If again, if it works for you, I'm not going to say you have to go and revamp it. Um, I, I gen as a general advice, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but if you're on five three five four, uh, use APC. APC will probably be the single most uh, time and uh, resource saving thing you can turn on. Okay. Now asterisk figure out how to reset your APC cache. Because in certain combination and configuration, the APC cache will try to read your old CVCRM file. So when you run an upgrade on CVCRM, the database will be upgraded, but it will pretend like it's still using the old files. OK? So APC is great, but know how to manage it. When you reset APC, if you've got multiple sites or multiple things going on in the same server, it'll wipe out the entire cache. Okay, so preferably do it not just before a thousand donors are about to come to your civic serum websites and hit it all at the same time. Um, both of those are officially supported. The Zend Optimizer is supported in the later version that's native to APC is like an add on to PHP. Zend Optimizer is now part of the uh, PHP development. Um, again, PH, uh, these caching mechanisms prevent redundant compiling and parsing. It, it just works. Uh, in Drupal, you have, you're going to have to have, uh, well, actually, for APC, nothing, neither in CVCRM nor uh, Drupal. the APC module to do it in Drupal? I think the APC module just shows you steps. Yeah, that just shows you the steps. You need memcache module in Drupal to run memcache, and you need to make a set, setting change in your settings PHP and in your CVCRM settings PHP for memcache. But for APC, I think you can just unwrap it and go. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Okay. I can do that. OK. Um, easy to config, dramatic results. It will eat up your RAM, though. <coughs> and another asterisk here is when you're using APC or, the, or a Zen cache, um, if, you're, if you're allocating too little of the RAM, it'll actually make things worse. Why? Right. Because it's, it's called thrashing. It's going to fill up your, your cache. And when the cache is filled up, it's, it's by default, it says, oh, I'm too full. I got to dispose of stuff. Right? So when you have too small of an allocation and you're trying to load a bunch of stuff into it, it's basically going load up, empty, load up, empty, load up, empty. And you end up in this no man's land of finally after 10 seconds, your page will load. And you go, wait a minute, but he said it's supposed to make dramatic difference. It does, but you have to have it configured properly. So figure out how to, res how to clear it, figure out how to look at the statistics, and get some, some decent idea. And again, I can't tell you if the right setting is uh, half a gig or a gig or two gigs for, for the allocation. You're going to have to look at it and see how often your cache clear takes place. Cache clear by itself is not a bad thing. If it happens once a week, fine. That's OK. That just means that 
it's replacing the files that are more frequently used with the one. Uh, it's putting in cache the files that are more frequently used and it's disposing of the files that are less frequently used. That's OK. Um, in Drupal, I already talked about the turning on the, the performance stuff. So for anonymous <coughs> users, you should really have the page caching turned on. Um, set the page expiration according to your needs. That does tend to throw clients for a loop when they log in. They go in, they make a change, or they post a blog post. When they're logged in, they actually see the new blog post, and they log out, and they can't see the blog post. Because you're running, you know, let's say a three and six hour uh, page cache, or a full day, or whatever it is, and or your views might not refresh cache. That's another level where uh, we've seen some of these confusions come up. So know what your clients are, um, and or your internal users and train them on that. Sometimes it's, it's enough to say, hey, if you see it as a logged in user, just wait for three hour, up to three hours, and then the cache will refresh, and you'll get the new content. That's fine, too. Um, CSS aggregation, you can minify the code, too, if you've got some um, complex CSS out there. GZIP compression we've talked about. CDN, anybody using CDN, Content Delivery Network? If you've got a lot of assets, especially video, audio, large files, and or um, a lot of images, let's say, and you've got users that are distributed across a geographic area, across continents, CDNs will effectively replicate what you have on your website and put it at a server closer to them. So when it's requesting that two and a half megabyte image times five in the old famous slideshow on the front page, right? And now you need to load up you know, 15 megs of, of slide, slideshows on the front page. Uh, it doesn't have to make a big trip back and forth, and these CDNs are generally set up to be very responsive. Um, so you can do that. Um, you can use Boost and some other modules out there in Drupal, Drupal land. Um, again, test it out, especially with CVCRM. Some of those may or may not play very nicely. Questions so far? How much are CDNs these days? Um, I mean, you can use something like uh, Cloudflare for 100 bucks a month. Yeah. Um, and again, there is good and bad things about it. Uh, Cloudflare will actually host your DNS too, and so nobody actually knows where your actual server is, and they will protect you from denial of service attacks. That's the good part. Um, despite their rules engine and a lot of other things, um, two things tend to happen. If your host is using any kind of blacklist checking, a lot of uh, Cloudflare's IPs end up, end up on the blacklist for obvious reasons. Uh, so sometimes your people will call you and say, hey, I can't access the, the site from this office, but when I go home, I can access it. What's going on? It's because the IP is blocked. Um, the other thing, um, despite their rules engine, we've seen a lot of issues there with um, Cloudflare trying to cache the administrative backend. Mm -hmm. Like you specify and say, when somebody's logged in and or they're on this particular URL, do not provide the cache and everything else, and it'll still do it, and that can create a lot of uh, headaches. So pros, cons. Same thing, if you're using CDNs and or subdomains and or SSL, um, your cookies and uh, your sessions and all those kind of things are going to give you headaches. These days, running on SSL, um, trying to think if I have a whole slide on SSL, but Google's already started. Everybody heard of the uh, mobile getting yesterday, mm -hmm. right? Google has basically stopped serving results. On, if you're somebody searching from a mobile phone for a site that is not mobile optimized, Google will actually not show you <coughs> any mobile results. Uh, it just lowers them. Or lowers them. Well, if it's on page 15, it pretty much doesn't show. But yeah, it basically lowers the ranking of the site. Uh, they're also taking into account if your site is running on SSL, they won't say how much weight it has, but they have said, Google has said that SSL sites will get higher priority than non-SSL sites. Uh, at the cost of SSL uh, these days and the performance penalty out there, I would say you should consider running your site on SSL. Um, what, have you had any success with like, CDNs with video as well? Or like, yeah. Know. Yeah, we've used some of those. and. Uh, you know, the good news is, and we've done, uh, we've even done 
trying to avoid kind of what I was saying with Cloudflare, we've done for clients where um, what we'll set up is like a subdomain for their own site. Mm -hmm. Because when the HTTP request comes in, they can, they, you can only receive so many parallel streams per domain. But if it's on a subdomain or CDN, you can actually stream multiple things. So even though you know your bandwidth, assuming you've got good internet connection, you can receive multiple things at the same time. So we've set up effectively like a fake CDN, where it's still being served by the same server because it's not the server CPU that's the limitation, but it's the HTTP request where you can only receive, I think, five at a time. Well, this effectively allows you to receive 10 at a time, 10 streams of data. So you can, you can do it that way. Um, redundancy, okay, so redundancy basically means is not backup. Redundancy basically means you've got everything you've got going on over here, you've got it multiplied several times, right? Um, so you can run all in one server, so the whole AMP stack, your database server and, and, and web server and everything else in one. Um, you can do it modularly, so you have a web server or multiple web servers up front and then one or multiple database servers behind. Uh, and a load balancer presumably somewhere uh, somewhere in front of it. So you can split that out. Um, that's really up to you. Uh, where and, and you have to do your own network kind of analysis. And now we're getting kind of into the advanced stuff. Uh, most, vast majority of clients really don't need, you know, if they go down for five or 10 or 15 minutes, it's probably not a big deal. Uh, but if you have mission critical stuff, you can put a load balancer and two mirrored web servers behind it and it'll work. Um, I just want to know how many people are um, putting their database server on a different uh, VPS or machine, because we found that the performance degradation was quite bad with uh, yeah. City CRM because there were so many- um, Calls back and forth. Yeah. John? Uh, we, by and large, don't do that for yeah. the exact reason, but we've also, um, using the Amazon Web Services stack, we've actually had pretty good results. Okay. Yeah. It depends on your provider. I would, I would tend to agree that kind of an all-in-one is generally better because uh, your, all your calls between the database and even to PHP can happen via sockets versus TCP. And that alone can save you some overhead. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it makes a difference when you scale up. Uh, so the module, and for MySQL, you can set up replication, you can set up, um, master slave, master master, which is like a master slave and the master slave back to the primary. Uh, anybody doing that? It's really cool because you can have two identical web servers running with a load balancer in front of it. Um, the challenge is, you know, then you get into row-based versus transaction-based replication. How are you replicating things? And especially if you're deduplicating a large data set or doing some big changes, it makes a difference. And the last thing you want to, want to get into is, oops, we have a a conflict because in the same millisecond the same incremental ID was used then the other option is which Civis CRM doesn't play very well along with is you can say okay we'll set this up over here and do auto increment by two or by five and then we'll set up the second server and do auto increment by five so here your your let's say CIDs in the context table are going to be one six eleven and so on and so forth, and here you'll start off at 2, and it'll be 2, 7, 12, and so on and so forth, right? Which, in theory, should work well, but for whatever reason, CVCRM tends to have issues with um, not auto-incrementing by 1. I don't know if that's been resolved. Don't ask me how I know. Yeah, I know, I know that's the case in the installer, where it's installer like, will freak out. Raw SQL and, um, have you run into that in other places? Uh, we've run into that uh, in deduplication. Uh, yeah. uh, we've run into that, I want to say during imports actually. Uh, yeah. And then we've run into it with a client who actually had some custom code. This was on the Drupal side. And they just assumed that auto increment meant by one. So they weren't checking the variables or anything. They just said increment by one. And every once in a while there was this weird issue that we couldn't figure out why it was until one day we got really unhappy about it and spent all weekend digging through their code and then we saw that they wasn't using the variable to auto increment it was just saying oh go plus one because of course when you're incrementing it's always only by one so um when you're um so so this is database right and then you have the file system so your files directory if you will um you can use the nfs you can use rsync you can use all sorts of different things 
Uh, Gloucester is another one of those. Um, all good stuff, but again, test, test, test. You know, bring it up, put a little balancer in front of it, set it all up. Not with your, don't test with your production. Um, set it all up, take one server down, bring it back up. See how it, see how it reacts. Uh, what happens to your temp files, your cache files, your, uh, you know, CVCRM templates, C, ENUS, and all the subdirectories there. What happens there? Right. So it's not necessarily for the faint of heart. That's why if you're wanting to, to have true redundancy in place, it costs. What's you know. your little note on rsync? Uh, oh, rsync. So when you're rsyncing, um, so, so you can, you don't have to set up like a mirrored uh, mounts or anything like that. You can just say, okay, every 15 minutes I want to rsync to a secondary server. But do you really need your cache files rsync? Do you really need your uh, image cache files rsync? Do you really need your whatever? So what you can do is, in your rsync, you can do an exclude from and then set up a file with, it's like a git ignore or something like that. So you can put in masks. Yeah, template C, all those kind of directories, you don't need any of that. So, but again, retest and re-verify your backup because sometimes you will put in something that you think you're being really cute and smart about how mm -hmm. you're putting the, putting the regex in there or something. And then you suddenly realize that there is another directory that matches that and that's not actually being backed up so um and by all means so we'll, we're going to talk about the uh, backup i think on the next slide here uh, one last thing i want to say you can have the best setups in place what are you doing about dns <coughs> because here's the kicker if you've got a primary server and your dns is pointed at that and you say oh we can't be down for you know 5 10 15 minutes even an hour right but we've got this secondary server that we can bring up, bring back up within five minutes, no problem. And we've got everything. We've got the database replicated. We've got everything in there. But it's got a different IP address, right? So how do you handle that? Because then if you have to go and change DNS and you have to wait for the DNS to propagate, effectively you're still down. And there are some ways to mitigate it. Some providers will let you use what's called like a flex IP address, or they will allow you to migrate the IP address to a different machine, but again, research it, identify it. That actually is, pro. the DNS part is probably the more significant weak point in redundancy setups than any, any of the other points. You can pretty much set up everything else and have it up and running, but that will, in a, in a true emergency, that will be a showstopper. Okay, um, backups, we put all of our configuration stuff in Git. It's a version control, so we know exactly, you know, if we change uh, MySQL configuration or PHP configuration, we know who changed, what changed, from what value to what, that, what value, when it changed, et cetera. Uh, that's just what we do. Uh, again, MySQL, you can do a replication to a secondary server. If you have a big database, if you have multiple databases on the primary server, you probably don't want to be doing MySQL dumps on a, you know, on a large database in, in, in the middle of the production environment. What's a better idea is to set up a replication server as a slave, set it up as a read-only, and then run your MySQL snapshots off of that. Right? You can also use uh, Drush to help you with uh, MySQL dumps. But Drush, depending on how you have it set up, can exclude, which is a feature and can be a drag, it can exclude uh, specific tables, like cache tables. Right? You don't need to be backing up cache tables. But if you don't have the original database and the table structure, when you import the database back, those cache tables will not be created for you. So you need to have the data structure in place before you do that import, even though the tables are going to be empty, which is fine. The caches will re regenerate. But if, if, Drup if Drush exports it out and the schema is not there, you're going you're gonna to struggle. Um, those are different options than Drush. So you yeah. can say exclude the structure or exclude the data. Correct. You, you want to exclude, exclude the, the data, data, not the structure. Exactly. So backup and migrate. Backup and migrate, yep. And a little PHP intensive. And I don't, you have to do it, effectively, you have to do it on a production environment. Yes, and uh, I mean, you can back up. You can, we've done it where we've, I mean, we've, always, I mean, we've always done it on production because it's smaller, site, smaller yeah. sites. 
but I have played or played around with running back the migrate on one server to back up a database on another. Okay. So it's, it's pretty <coughs> possible using uh, brush uh, aliases. Okay. So it takes some configuration to set it up, but you could use backup and migrate. Um, whatever you do in backup and migrate, make sure that whatever directory you're backing up to, it's not in your web root. Please. <laughs> okay. I've seen that plenty of times. Just like SSL keys, server card keys, and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, same thing with file system. Fi you can do file snapshot. There is a little open source utility called Dervish. That will you can set it up how long you want to you know keep the dailies or you know you can run it as, as often as you want. It'll keep the diffs, um, so you know what's going on there. Uh, hopefully everybody's using some kind of soft, software version control. Git, preferably I assume, but uh, hopefully you're using something. Um, and then the last but not least point on on the backups is uh, take them offsite, please. I can't tell you how many times we've had people come to us and say our site's been hacked, our server's down, something's happened, we don't know what's going on, but we have a backup. Great, you're doing better than pretty much 90% of the people that are in trouble, right? You go, so where's your backup? Well, it's on the server. Adding a backup on a server that's just been hacked or can be accessed for whatever reason isn't backup. It's like backing up your laptop to the laptop. You know, if that laptop disappears or hard drive crashes, it doesn't do you any good. I was talking to somebody here yesterday that was saying, oh yeah, we have this great rate set up and everything else. And that was, I talked to him about a year ago. And then yesterday he was actually sharing with me that unbeknownst to him, they lost one hard drive off the, off the raid, which is okay, yeah, you go back, you replace it. But nobody was notified. So when they lost the second hard drive, now they're paying somebody big money is in tens of thousands of dollars to try to retrieve their data off of the corrupted RAID drives. So um, again, RAID is not necessarily a backup. RAID is just a redundancy of the hard drives that you're running. Take the data somewhere, put it off site. People call me OCD, which I probably am. We have five different levels of backup, and one of those actually says it's in, the, in a safe deposit box in a bank. <laughs> I'm paranoid about the data, so our clients don't have to be. You know, look at how many levels you need and retest. That's another thing is if you have backups, retest rest restoring off of the backups. All right, uh, really quickly, logging, turn it on, look at it. You know, you can use something simple like the syslogs, uh, logstash to put, pull it all together, uh, Lumberjack, and then Elasticsearch, Graphite, Kibana, tools to visually present it back so you don't have to scroll through a bunch of text files. Um, set it up, configure it as needed, as desired. Uh, it will, it can, it has the potential to eat up your bandwidth as you're transferring things to a different server. And again, just because you're logging it, if nobody's looking at it, <coughs> you know, can't help you. Look for trends, you know. And again, do you need, uh, I think I have monitoring here. So do you need nodules? Do you need uh, Zenos? Do you need Zmonic, Unit, Cacti? What do you need? How quickly do you need to know about this? Do you need proactive notification of saying, hey, something's, something's out of the ordinary? Or do you just need, hey, your hard drive space on this day went from 50% to 75%. You know, some giant temp file was created or something like that happened. Um, so take a look at all of these. Um, actually analyze it. Look at your Google Analytics. See, maybe your traffic's just spiked so much. We've seen that happen. Um, and then other tools, Puppet Check, Vagrant, do load testing with uh, AV, Apache Bench, which is built into Apache. Uh, use Solar if, if you need to, mail servers we kind of talked about. Mm -hmm. And uh, search, for, search for resources. Uh, obviously, groups.drupal.org, uh, there is a high performance uh, group out there. There is a web host listed on Drupal and CDCRM. Again, on the Drupal side, I would, I would caution a little bit because it's more of somebody pays a fee and that gets them qualified to be listed. So that doesn't automatically mean they know exactly what you're going to need and how you're going to need to um, do it. So that's CVCRM hosting performance optimizations. Questions, comments, stories? So 
one of the things one of the things I was hoping you would cover mm -hmm. specifically is some of the large queries that um, that ha that happen on on CBCRM specifically um, search queries. Okay. We have got it working really really well now after moving to um, SSD drives. Okay. But even with memcache. It was timing out on. They have several um, contact reference CBCRM contact references. Okay. And it was timing out on pulling up any of the um, references. Yeah. And I, it's not. It wasn't showing up in a long in the uh, long query in long queries or anything okay. like that. Just was timing out. Um, my first question is which version of CBCRM you're running because in the last uh, dot releases releases there's been improvements to the search functionality so before, I would before that but, okay yeah. so I would I would look at that and again I'm not saying go and upgrade right now but maybe set up a, another site upgrade that and we run the same queries on a server of a similar setup and see if that uh, that makes any difference or what you can do is you can um, try and capture the query that's causing problems mm -hmm. and uh, then use uh, some analyzers to see what the problem is with the query yeah. and see if there are you know, missing indexes or something else wrong. Could be. And, you know, again, in CBCRM upgrades, it's not unusual to um, have altered data structures. We just went through an upgrade with a client from some really, really old uh, stuff that they upgraded to a certain point. And it was always working until one particular version upgrade where there was some change in the database structure and what the script was expecting just wasn't there. We had to go in, manually change the tables. But we didn't just leave it at that. We went in and actually compared the schema of a new install with what ultimately happened with the script. Might work fine for a long time, but again, when it, it, it's generally going to come back and haunt you at the most inconvenient time. So. I can share a quick story. When we migrate clients off of wherever they are, let's say to our hosting, uh, triggers. Anybody ever get problems with trigger uh, who, ownership of triggers? Yeah. All right. That's a CBCRN specific use case. Mm -hmm. So, and if you don't know what's going on, you're just going to keep running into that wall. Um, I was wondering if you had anything to say about PHP interpreter engines using like PHP FPM versus mod PHP. If anybody's using HHVM for city. Yeah, we we haven't run into H HHVM uh, with PHP. We are using FPM, um, and that's that's kind of that's kind of the early days of Nginx, where when they when Nginx and PHP FPM came up and they started working together, that's when you saw the biggest difference from way back when in Apache. And we've stayed with it. I know that they've rewritten the other portions to kind of mimic some of the memory allocations, et cetera, since then. So today it's probably not as big of a uh, difference between those two systems. I think you, you can expect a performance boost from FPM versus the other options. Um, but going from there, if you wanted to fine tune it further, don't look to HHVM, look to improving CVCRM. This yeah. is HHVM versus FPM is not the performance problem. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. And it, as you can see, I mean, there is enough providers and uh, other people that in some way deal with hosting. So this is not, you know, when you're going into this, hosting is a consideration. Hosting is a big deal. Um, Sending out email is a big deal. Maintaining, getting things you know upgraded, putting in security patches, doing the backups, etc. <laughs> it's something that in your launch plans, release plans, ongoing plans needs to be accounted for. Um, and all of us are sitting here, and we talk on forums or whatever, and we talk about it tomorrow. Uh, John and Mark and I and Nicola will be sitting in on a session on importing large data sets. Again, another topic that. You know, we do a round table on it almost on an annual basis nowadays, and we have some new features and some new things, and there is just some old true and trusted methods to do it. And we're always learning and always trying to figure out how to do something different, and it's the same thing with hosting. Performance, same, same thing. We're always trying to figure out. It's not, there's not a one, do it this way. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't consider myself really a sysadmin at all. So I just buy managed servers. 
uh, hosting. And then, you know, I have the hammer that I know, and so I do uh, MySQL optimization for yeah. the large databases of, you know, 600,000 contracts and stuff. Sure. And so, uh, uh, what are the downsides from your perspective as real sysadmin types with just using, you know, a, a good managed host? Yeah. Uh, is calling. <laughs> the happy hour has started. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so I'll, I'll so, so I don't try and get them to do any of this fancy optimization. Stuff. Yeah, I would say the 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 thing is okay. So you can get a VPS or a or a managed server. And my question, this is funny. Um, my question would be um, the, the 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 word of caution I would have to the managed servers, and I think this is really important because a lot of times people come to us and say, "Oh yeah, we're on a managed server." What are they managing? Yeah, so there is I'm no also, standards for us. Not only the current performance problems, but also making sure it's managed. Those are the two that I look for. Well, are they managing the operating system? Are they managing your Nginx or Apache? Are they are they managing everything up to the CMS is what I want? Okay, you know, and then if you can get a good a good provider for that, that's that's a good find. You know, we still we've tried a few of those, and we still struggle to find somebody who's truly a good manage hosting provider and I mean the ones that we've seen that promise to do that um, I mean some of them are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds or thousands of dollars a month yeah, and so what maybe I'm not putting my point across rather than spending a lot of time and effort on this yeah I, I buy a bigger server and, yeah. uh, you know, it's like I, I don't care about all that yeah. optimization stuff I'll just invest a bit more in server resources. Yeah, and, and, and in this day and age, it's pretty easy to say, you know what, we don't need to be struggling with a four gig server, let's just go to an eight gig VPS and you know our problems go away. Um, to an extent, that works, to an extent. At some point, things don't scale. You know, We were just looking at some code earlier today that uh, somebody else wrote and now it's in our lap and it probably sc scaled really well when it was, you know, Sample size, test size of three, but now that they have three thousand, it just you know it's throwing out one hundred forty thousand queries on every page loop. That one function, it's like okay, that doesn't scale. Um, I'll leave you with a with a story, and again, it it might work to a, to a point, and if you know if it ain't broken, you don't have to go fixing it. Uh, we had a client. This is several years back, where uh, the largest Amazon instance at that point was I think the sixteen seventeen gigabyte instance. And they've been incrementally upping and upping and upping until they were on the extra, extra, extra large, and there was nothing larger than that. And they were kind of like, okay, do we now separate our database from the web server? What do we do here, right? And still, I mean, their problem was they were it was taking 15 seconds to load a page, and that was only 50% of the time. The other 50% of the time, they just got after 15 seconds a timeout, blank page done, which is obviously very frustrating to the visitors. We didn't do any optimization or anything. We just took what they had because they, they're like, we're going to bring you in. We're going to you know, figure out where our code is messed up because they did have some spaghetti code. And uh, you're going to figure it out. And we looked at it and we're like, OK, this is just the underlying, the managed part. Yeah, there's spaghetti code and all of this stuff here. But from here on down, there is some stuff here that's just bad, badly configured, et cetera. Didn't do anything except lifted their site dropped it on our server infrastructure, we went from 15 seconds page load to four second page loads 100% of the time. Still not optimal, but that just shows you what a well configured and well misconfigured um, installation or infrastructure can do for you. And then we eventually got them from four seconds, and this was a Drupal City Serum installation, we got them down to the four or 500 millisecond page load times, which is about what you can generally expect, roughly. So, you can do that, and I told them, I said, we can get you from 15 seconds to 12, but that's not really what you're talking about here. So we just did an experiment. I'm like, give us time. We'll put it on. So it does make a difference. So if you find a good managed server provider, awesome. And you can manage from the CMS on up, and that's all you're responsible for. Or there's others that, you know, there's some hosts that will give you a certain level, and you still have to manage a partially your level, and then you're up on your own, and you have others that do the hosting and the maintenance and the backups and all that stuff and all you worry about is the content. So. Michael? Uh, about um, hosting the database on the same server, is there some point with database size where you built that recommendation? 
I don't think that I have a good rule of thumb for that. I don't think I have it because it really depends on okay, what are you storing in the database? Is it just the number of the records? Is it all the different relationships and the queries that are doing the joins <coughs> to present something? Are you you know, what do you have going on? Mm -hmm. So I don't think there is a hard and fast rule that I would say, you know, once you get to two gigs database or you know whatever the size of the database is, you know, and th those are the kind of things that also impact where I might say, you know what, at this point I wouldn't do this on a production like the backups but I would do it on a secondary server, but I would still not separate the primary one from the web server from the database. Okay, a couple last comments because I know beer's flowing, so. <laughs> <laughs> Just, uh, like, on the same subject there, so we got uh, maybe a, the room that we got time to sign up for work, uh, and at the moment they and set it up, so they split out the database and the web server. <laughs> I would guess that they're still on the same physical hardware. Um, the, the database and the, and the website. That, that sounds like the worst of all possibilities. Because yeah. you're basically you're running two virtual engine, virtual machines. So you're, you're 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 not saving yourself any CPU. Those virtual machines are still competing for the same underlying resources. Yeah. But you're paying a penalty for the virtualization and for the communication. This is a big virtualized stack. I mean, they've got loads of stuff. So it's kind of like it's not just for Sibian, you know, they've got their exchange server and everything else okay. going through that. So, but I'm just wondering, you know, it sounds like maybe, you know, I don't know if it's easy to make that kind of assumption, but it might be better to bring that together into one larger virtualized instance. That's what I would recommend. That's what I would recommend. I mean, again, not knowing any, any details, yeah. just seems, to make, more sense seems to make a bit more sense because I would still say there is a there is a performance penalty for the second virtualization and for the TCP yeah. connection between those two. Okay. Yeah. You have a Small aside, most of this is, has led towards a, a VPS model for hosting them. For smaller sites, mm -hmm. VPS per site, or do you, I mean, how do you manage it? Well, you can do you can do uh, VPS per site. Dep again, depending on what, what you're trying to do, you know, can you spin up these VP? How many? Are you dealing with five clients and five VPS? Okay, you can handle them one on one. If you're dealing with 50, and they're maybe even all microsites of each other, maybe it makes more sense to put it on a multi-site, right? Uh, if you're putting it on a multi-site, how do you handle sites all modules versus site site modules? or themes, or upgrades, or, yeah. you know? So it starts getting kind of intertwined. That was real fun back in 2010. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, the resources are relatively cheap to do it, but now the, you know, I say in our case, is our hosting is effectively free. It's the maintenance and all the other upkeep that really costs the money. Yeah. That's where the real cost is today. So, all right, thank you everybody. Thank you.